I'm Professor Langdana at Rutgers Business School's Executive MBA program, also known as The Powerhouse. Today we're going to explore the links between Federal Reserve announcements and wild swings in the stock market. We're not going to hide behind masses of huge equations, but instead we're going to explore the bedrock theory and use the underlying intuition to try and demystify the links between Fed announcements and these massive swings in the stock market. So with that, welcome to the inaugural edition of Fireside Chats with Farouk. Of the economy. Let's start with some basic economics here. And hang in there with me. Most of you have seen this before. On this axis, we have output and jobs. Low output, these are annual growth rates. Low output, maximum output. Low jobs, maximum jobs. On this axis, we have the inflation rate, P. So P is inflation, Y is output. Generally speaking, what we find over time, that as output increases, supply, as aggregate supply or total supply or the national output increases, inflation increases too. It kind of makes sense. The supply of anything goes up as the price of that thing goes up. Supply of apples goes up as price of apples goes up. National output goes up, inflation rate goes up. So this is the supply, aggregate supply. And what happens here is once this aggregate supply reaches this point here, where we have maximum output and maximum jobs, it kind of hits a wall. You can't go beyond maximum output and maximum jobs. So this curve heads up. So this is the aggregate supply or total supply cur curve of the economy. It goes to maximum and goes straight up. And this story we are discussing here is the Keynesian story, named after the economist John Maynard Keynes. And this is the Keynesian aggregate supply curve. And this is the model that the Obama administration believes in, Ben Bernanke at the Fed believes in. Essentially, this country is being run by Keynesians right now. Um, Keynesians uh, live and grow up and work in hotbeds like Princeton University, MIT, Harvard, Rutgers University, New Brunswick some time ago. So the Keynesian model. Please note there's another model called the supply side model. And if they were here now, they would drag me to the ground. They would pull me, they would actually walk out of this room. And so that's a subject of another fireside chat with me sometime in the future. Today we are sticking with the Keynesian model because that's the world we are in now. So supply curve, here's the demand curve for the economy. Total demand for everything, tanks, guns, planes, software, tourism, pharmaceuticals, software. As the price falls, the demand increases. Typical demand curve as P, the inflation rate falls, but Output increases as P falls, demand increases, and here's the supply curve. Let's superimpose the total demand curve on the total supply curve. And here we are, let's say we start with low output. So here is an economy. When, when we take a photograph of the economy at any point in time, that's where the total demand and total supply intersect. So right now in this story, we have output low, low jobs, low jobs, low output, and here is some inflation rate. So this is an economy that's dead in the water, <coughs> excuse me, that needs to be jump-started. We need jobs in this economy. And so the only option here, from a diagrammatic perspective, is somehow if we could move this line from blue to red, somehow if we can go from blue to red, we jump-start this economy. We increase output. This is Y high. And more jobs. And please, no need to write all this down. We'll be providing you with a link or an email address. You can reach out to me and I'll be glad to send you the text of this discussion. In fact, chapters from my fourth book. So to stay with me, no need to copy this. <clears throat> Excuse me. So moving this aggregate demand curve to the right, this is called jump-starting an economy. This is what Keynes taught us. The technical the expression for this is demand-side stabilization. So how do you do this? How do you go from blue to red? And if you were to wake up President Obama in the middle of the night and say, what are you dreaming about? He would say, take me to red. If I go to red, I make history. If I'm stuck here in blue, it's all over. And so this was what the Obama stimulus plan was supposed to do. This is when countries are trying to create jobs, this is what they're trying to do. So how do you go from blue to red? We're focusing on the central bank today, the Fed, 
happen. So here we go, folks. Embedded in this aggregate demand curve, we have consumption. This is what you and I buy. Furniture, eating out, restaurants, clothing, electronics. So this is like 70% of the economy. Then you have capital investment. And capital investment in macroeconomics, please note, this is where we are going to be in today's fireside chat, if you will. This is what the Fed or the central bank will try and influence. Capital investment in macro is new plant and equipment, housing. So let's just put this down in here. Housing is in here. This is the monster that's been giving us so much grief. New plant and equipment. And so these two are big determinants. They're, 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 they're big factors in capital investment. There's also government spending in here and so on. But we're going to be sticking with capital investment that has got housing and new plant and equipment. This is what the central bank tries to increase. So how do you get housing to go up? How do you get companies to suddenly start investing in new offices, factories, plants, labs? Well, here's, here's a takeaway. Capital investment requires borrowing. Vacation homes, new homes. This requires borrowing. So how do you increase borrowing? How do you induce people to borrow more? So you can do capital investment, so you can move this line out, so you can create more jobs. Well, make it cheaper. Make the price of borrowing cheaper. In other words, lower interest rates. So here's where the central bank comes in. So the Fed basically needs to lower interest rates. These are short-term interest rates, which will increase capital investment. And this is how it was supposed to work, which is what happened. Interest rates fell in 2007, 2008, from roughly six to zero. And another question, how do you lower interest rates? I mean, how do you lower the price of anything? How do you lower the price of apples? When you have too many apples in the market, prices of apples fall. Too many houses in the market, glut of housing in the market, price of housing falls. Too many IT people in the market, IT people's salaries fall. So how do you lower the price of money? You make more money. So this is what Ben Bernanke and the central bank do. They flood the money with liquidity, flood this, I beg your pardon, flood the economy with liquidity. They create more money thereby lowering the interest rate, the price of money, thereby hopefully increasing capital investment and jump-starting the economy. So this is what the plan is. The Fed increases the money supply, decreases interest rates, and increases, therefore, capital investment. And this is how it was supposed to work. And so when you have, in the paper I just held up a few minutes ago, when the Fed, the Ben Bernanke was suggesting that they're going to continue this loose money policy, no wonder the market surged the next day. Because that meant the Fed was going to continue with this tailwind, was continue trying to go from blue to red, and hey, that's going to cause the stock market to go up. Because you're flooding the economy with a tailwind, putting more gasoline in the engine, stepping on the gas, whichever, whichever analogy you prefer. So here we are, folks. Now the question is, this has been done tremendously. 85 billion a month of new money has been created over the last few years. The question is, given that we should be way the heck out here, we should have pumped the economy all the way to maximum output. And how come in reality what we have at this point in time in the summer of 2013 is we are just barely here. So in reality, we are just finally getting some traction, but given the amount of money we printed, we should have been here, should. What happened? What happened over all these years? What happened with this huge money creation, virtually unprecedented in our history? And here's another takeaway for you. Please remember folks, this only happens if the money that the Fed has created is actually spent. If the Fed provides liquidity, it creates money, 
And that money, if it doesn't trickle through the economy, doesn't ripple through the economy, if it sits at the banks, nothing happens. Increase money supply till the cows come home, but the economy will not shoot forward. Repeat, will not shoot forward unless people actually borrow the money that the banks have now have, this increased money supply, and start spending it. Till that money changes hands, it just sits there, liquidity trap. Why does that happen? Well, because people aren't borrowing. Why? They're afraid of new taxes, more regulation. They're, they're afraid of um, well, expenses caused by Obamacare in some cases, small and med medium-sized businesses. Uh, persistent unemployment. You know, when you're not sure of your job or if you're still unemployed, you're not looking for a new vacation home or your first home. And so uncertainty. Companies are sitting on cash because of concerns of taxes and regulation. And so while the money supply was increased, we never really shot out. We are now finally just nudging out here because of liquidity trap. The banks are sitting on tons and tons of cash. So by the way, how does the Fed create this money? Does it simply print money? Hey, you know, if you had said that seven, six years ago, I would have been all condescending and I would have said, no, we don't print money. <laughs> Argentina, Brazil, those, those are the bad boys and girls. And Israel in the 1970s, they print money. We are, we are above all that. I remember in France, um, my French students, I taught in France for over nine years, and my French students would say, so, that's gold? What backs the dollar? Is that gold? And I would say, no, there is no gold backing the dollar. Not since 1971, since Nixon said, no more gold. Window. And so that's gone. And so we had nothing backing the dollar except the reputation of our country. And we rocked till 2008. So let me just give you a quick rundown of what this was all about. So how does the Fed increase money? Well, you know what? Today, we are printing it. I have to get off my high horse and say, yeah. We are printing it now, but before 2008, this is how the Fed increased the money supply. The Fed would buy bonds from the private banks. And let's say there's a bank of uh, Neil Shah, my director here and former student, uh, who is organizing and directing the session. So they buy a $1,000 bond from the bank of Neil. $1,000 bond from bank B, bank C. The banks have to sell to the Fed. The Fed then pays these banks, if you will, by creating money. Not back to gold, not back to anything. You know, I won't forget that headline in the Financial Times. It said, the day the dream died. And for monetary purists like me, that was a shock. It rocked my world. And you're probably thinking, Professor Langdana needs to get out more. And you're probably right. What happened in 2008? Since 2008, till the present, the Fed started buying all the junk of the subprime crisis, the liar loans, the no-doc loans, the Mickey Mouse loans, all the junk. We taxpayers are holding all those horrible bonds and all those guys who are stuck with those bonds, stuck with those horrible mortgages, have unloaded them to the Fed. The Fed bought them by creating money and is still buying them by creating more money. 85 billion a month. Monster monetization monster dumping of liquidity in the economy. So this has been a world, a huge amount of money has been pumped in to try and get us from here to there. Finally though, we've gone from here to here. And earlier this summer, there was a notion that the Fed is going to stop doing this. Well, you might wonder why. I mean, what's there to lose? You're not, you're not back to gold, you're not losing anything. You're turning on the money machine and going out for dinner, so to speak. You're coming back next morning and the money machine is still running, so to speak. You're printing money, you're banging out 85 billion a month. Let it go. Why do you want to stop doing it? Well, here's the problem. There is no free lunch, right? We all know that. You can't keep printing money forever. The best analogy I can give you is you're pumping gasoline in your basement. That's fine. Until there's a spark. That's when this whole thing is going to go up. Boom. So right now you've got in money packed in the banks. No one's borrowing it, so to speak. No one's hardly borrowing it. But once there's traction in the economy, once those green pieces of paper start changing hands or the velocity of money increases, for those of you who remember your macro, inflation, prices will start rocketing up fast. The Fed doesn't want to be caught with its pants down. 
So that money, that gasoline sitting in the basement has to be slowly sucked back in when the economy starts developing some traction. And it looks like there is finally some traction now. So earlier this summer, there was a notion of the Fed stopping this bond buyback. And essentially, it's going to stop going from, stop this tailwind. This tailwind that's taken us from this blue to this black may be curtailed, pun intended. And so what you have here is investors are thinking, wow, without this tailwind, we're going to essentially drop back down. You know, we're going to smash back down. This is what all these years of pumping so much money finally got us going. If they're going to turn off that switch, if they're going to turn off that fan, we're going to drop back down. And so there was a sense that any day now when the Fed stopped the tailwind, people would jump out of the stock market and the market would come crashing down. The big correction, which is still anticipated, I guess, by some. And the opposite holds true. If the Fed were to say, hey, hey, guys, we're not going to stop this tailwind. We're going to keep on the tailwind. We're going to keep on printing money. We're going to try and keep pushing this curve out relentlessly like we've been doing. The stock market would love it. Hey, they're still playing the game. Let's hang in there. And that's exactly what happened yesterday and today. Here we go. Yesterday, Fed affirms easy money tilt. In other words, the Fed has said, we are going to keep doing this tailwind thing. thing. We're going to keep increasing the money supply and you're going to be moving to the right. And investors loved it, which is obviously no surprise. The next day, stock surge to fresh highs. So they're jumping back on board. They're saying, you know what, let's ride this baby a more to the right. And the subtitle is, skittish investors gain courage from Fed chiefs reassurance on easy money policy. Reassurance, because they initially thought he was going to stop this and move back. And so basically Ben Bernanke said, calm down people, I'm going to play along a little bit longer and they're loving it. So Fed, stock market, lots of fuss, lots of drama. Hope this session here has demystified some of these links. Thank you so much for joining us and you have my email, you have my coordinates. Do reach out to me and do stay in touch because there'll be more fireside chats from the Rutgers Executive MBA program. Signing off now from the powerhouse. Thank you for joining us.